Ultra wide, ultra wide. Okay, so this side, and then you do this, and then you need to do this. Uh, I think this can stay here. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah, this is um, this is the easiest version. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's take a look at uh, your... Okay, we're done. It's, uh, it's rolling. No, you guys are coming with this. Um, okay. Just speak to this. Yes. And for the guy, for the person that is on the tooltop, uh, the camera is technically facing this way, so... This is one of the things. I told you to press that to level up. Okay, because I'm 44 right now. Yeah. If you're going to start uh, standing up, speaking? Yes. Uh, usually, Juan is the. Uh, yeah, so he will be standing up. Well, yes. Yeah. I got this little cheeky. Uh, oh, okay. Habla. Habla. Habla.
At the same time, that was yeah, the same show. Sure. Yeah. I, I gotta talk to you about your your drawings that you've been putting up. You know, from the oh yeah, the the, 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 pe the pencil ones. The, the, yeah. Those are those are those are prints. Yeah, right. Yeah. The, the, prints? Those prints, yeah. I thought you drew, made them by hand. The drawings, they they. The people speeds and stuff like that. No, that's a print. And how did you? Oh. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's an engraving. Well, They're engravings, they yeah. And, and and you started to write and stuff like that, and it's good. And I almost I almost got uh, opened your account at uh, Artery uh -huh. because every time that you you do something like that, you just put it do it to Artery, so that's in your goes into your vault. And right now the the the, uh, the Instagram. You know the last time I showed it to you a month or half or two months ago. You you have we had you have 546. The Inst the Yale don't have 1,546. Same number. Yeah. Yours yours is uh, up to five. Uh, 50 something from the 46. Do you know what the, the what it was? One thousand seven hundred and fifty from five from fifteen hundred. So mm. almost we're going up like three hundred, and they've been picking up every you know. So when when it when it comes time to to run a series, uh, you can, once you put it in there, you see the the people that were following. They like ready to hit the road. So but you don't want to put nothing in until we're ready, and you got to be ready with your stars. So mm -hmm. you know, and and I think we can you know, really do it. But, so, but keep doing that, man. And and, and, uh, and then you can add some more. Uh, and a very interesting woman, who's a teacher and everything. She started following this. Hello, 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 hello. You got you got to see. She she. I think when she came in, she I must have given out to her students and everything. Room because all of a sudden we get. Yeah. And she's local. Uh, you got. We had a, a, a big group of students visit the, the gallery yesterday. Oh, good. Yeah. From, where? from, where? from uh, I think they were from Connecticut. And, and how did and how, how did who brought them over? I, I don't know because Jay was there and you know Jay doesn't keep track of anything, mm. you know. Mm. So I, when I came in, did they I asked them. I asked them. They left. The, they signed in. Yeah. He had them sign in. But you said you got like their email and stuff like that? I don't know. I, 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 I got to look at it. But I know he they signed in. And when I asked him, he said, oh, they, yeah. But he called me up. I said, I was far. I said, I can't go over there now, Jay. Just explain to them what the gallery, what the exhibition is, and get them to sign in. And he did. You know? so when I got back, I asked him, yeah, they did sign in. Hey, guys. Mm -hmm. How are you? Good. How are you doing? All right. Are you, are you documenting this for, for Tayel, your own, the own thing? No. Yeah, yeah this, is, this is what I hear. Yeah. Yeah. We'll put it on the website. By, by the way, there, you got no PA. Okay. Yeah. He couldn't do it. He got the, the last one broken. He put a new one. And they wanted, he was too, an essay that people were one, whatever. Oh, no, forget about it. Oh, this is clear. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. He put that. So yeah. That was that for Machina. Rinky. Yeah. So, and mira, yo vine, pra, you know, for us, I came here early. I, I said, let me see what you hook up with. Yeah. But he doesn't know, he just said, yeah. He doesn't know, you know. He doesn't know what he's doing? No, and not only that, he, he's doing everything. So they had him doing the time that we could have, the time that we could have spent putting it together, he was uh, uh, taking stuff to the basement, moving a whole exhibit down to the basement. You know, at the, so he used them up. So next thing you know, he finishes and we're over here with people here already. Yeah, you know, that's yeah. not how you do things. You know? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, mm -hmm. to each his own, you know? Yeah. Okay, we're going to start with, uh, with our technician.
trying to figure out something about how to get volume to the drinking water. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. And we have a Facebook going on, right? Oh, yes. That's already running. Okay. Very good. Um, okay. You are muted now. Move in a little more. We, yeah. Very good. Here. Good. So, hello. We're there. Okay. All right. Good afternoon and welcome to White Box. No inside. No inside that. We refer to ourselves. Right? Um, we have some technical difficulties, like uh, CNN had with our president, <laughs> or Ron DeSantis, I'm so yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we're, yeah. we're a pair with the politics of coming up soon. Right. So it's super interesting, right? As interesting as it was studied for in the 60s, right? when this bunch of superb, little crazy guys, probably like ourselves, began to put together the first, to me, I may be wrong, but it's the first time any Latin American uh, cultural people, artists, etc., get together, right? Behind what they will be explaining themselves, I don't want to be wrong and too many things because I have my own ideas. Yeah? Um, so, Diego Boricua kicks in in 1969. Um, they open next door to the young lords, etc. All this will be in this conversation. What I'm going to say is that this is curated by Johanna Roa, the feminist art historian, and um, joined by Butts recently, a year ago, with Material Archiving Resistance. And while but this is the first project in a program called New York Artscapes, where we're going to continue taking the polls of immigrant communities, not people, etc., etc. And we've been doing for six years Exodus, see with Chinese in this village, this and that. But this is a different program, which will be taking the polls of all these main communities that end up in New York City. Uh, the next show is going to have Ecuadorian and Puebla, Mexico, probably together in the same show. And it's going to be fabulous because Johanna has already found um, contributions. Ahora sí. Contributions from out there. Sí, claro. So anyhow, um, there's in the new archives of the next community, uh, Johanna has found conversation on VHS as letters that used to send 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, radio stations, Puebla has here. So all these interactions are going to be brought here to my box proper. Yeah? And it's going to be very exciting because in the moment when everybody's busy out there seeing what's the latest thing happening anywhere, right? In the art market and, you know, and the multi-millionaires uh, buying more art in Galore, uh, Basquiat going for $75 million to try to fake, right? We're going to concentrate on grassroots, what the hell is going on with every other. Bangladesh came to um, Harlem, Central Park in the 1920s. I will have connections in a new book, Bengali, New York. So really, this is one of my crazy ideas to retire from out there and let dust in the marketplace. But we've been in the middle of it, like in Chelsea support, and just come back you know, to a place like this. And I recognize some faces that also have kind of this oil into this area. Yeah. And they gave up the idea of Tribeca to come here to what we call a series of communities. Even the kids, I mean, are here $65 a month. Uh, we have five infants in there. But they're all on, uh, on, uh, on, on loans. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, Johanna and Ron, curator, will introduce everybody. Thank you. Uh, yes. Into the Hello, everybody. Uh, firstly, I would like to say thanks, thanks to Juan because we have worked uh, on this project probably uh, for two years since uh, we met. You know, you met with uh, Marco that was two years ago in Harlem, and he said something about you know a, a workshop of the New York and, and oh my God, what's that? Then at that moment, and probably I, I already mentioned you. Uh, 
I remember something that happened 10 years ago when I bought a book about our workers' coalition in Mexico City. And I was quite interested in that book because I focused in archival practices. So in a prat, somewhere in the profile, they say some, and some Latin Americans were involved in the movement. I was like, oh my god, you know? A press to say that, you know, there were Latin Americans working there then. Uh, I had a, you know, something like a dream thinking, oh my god, I would like to develop that project with that. And where they meet, and we talk uh, about that topic, I, I was really excited. And thanks, Marcos, you know, for sharing with me uh, the material, your stories, uh, your art too, at the same time, uh, has been a very exciting process. Uh, uh, and I'm saying in a professional and personal way. So thank you so much. I would like to say uh, thank you to the artists, Esperanza Cortez, um, Lori Horowitz, Lira Puerta, Ellen Al, Yolanda Vasquez, uh, that you know, some people, including uh, Ricky, that is uh, today with us, you know, they say that that the woman that is in the front window look like a Adela, one of the New Yorkian person famous in the neighborhood. So that's amazing. Probably, you know, is that woman. I'm not sure, but you know, I'm gonna jump on that. Okay. So thanks to the speaker. Thank you, Stephen, Marco. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you so much. Uh, just me. I will read about your, you know, bio a little bit in a while. But thank you because we have, you have been working with the Taller Boricua Latin American community. Thank you to uh, Jorge Lozano, who is online with us. He's traveling tomorrow to Cuba, so now it's La Roche. So thank you to do that. And with Esperanza, a beautiful human being and magnificent artist. So thank you. Uh, I would like to read something to short. Um, to then I'm going to introduce you the first of, of speaker that is Marcos. So, um, mm, uh, the Taller Boricua early on had the vision of developing programs that revolve around the reclaiming of Puerto Rican roots, including the rescue of the Taino past process of social and educational resistance in schools and public space in East Harlem linking with the young lords, support for families of young people killed by the police, and dissemination of New York and cultural production. I would like to say more things, but I believe that we should start. So I'm going to read a short video of uh, our speaker. It's a really short video because they are powerful people who have had a <coughs> great path in their life. So. Marcos Dimas was involved in the Art Workers Coalition during the late 60s, and then he co-founded the Taller Boricuas, an artistic collective. In 1970, he decided to forsake his early training in modern art to begin a quest for alternative source. This led him to embrace the art of extinct Taino Indian people in his homeland, Puerto Rico. He also studied filmmaking at the School of Visual Art and later in the WNEG Film Television School. Uh, thank you to be today, Marcos, please. Okay, thank you everybody for coming. Where do you want me to start? <laughs> oh my God. The beginning. Anyway, be before we go on, that uh, print out there is by Yolanda Velasquez, and that is an image of Belkis Ayon. A Cuban filmmaker. Okay, anyway, just to get that straight. That, that's a <laughs> young. Not Doña, what's her name? Doña Adela. Doña Adela. Doña Adela. You know, that, that has been an issue because during the process, you know, to get the documents and find the yeah. information. And it's curious because this is probably the third archive that I'm working on. That's the thing that always is happening, you know, the memories and ideas than a person like I, you know, you can have and tell to the people sometimes there is something broke in between in the, in the documents and the oral history. You know, when I saw that piece that was the last piece that we brought to the exhibition, actually it, it wasn't included in, in this show, you know, I, that, you know, because you brought the whole material that there was piece because 
like saw it in the workshop, and I'm like, a, you know, that was uh, behind of a desk, and I said, what's that? Oh, it's a piece, uh, the author is, uh, I don't remember, but I, I don't remember all, but I will send you the information, you know, yeah. and it's good to have the name now, thank you. Yeah, I know what ask it, yeah. She it's a very powerful piece. It's a huh? powerful, very powerful piece. Very powerful piece, piece. Yeah. Yeah. yes. That's a, uh, that's a woodcut. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, so I, uh, my story begins when I get, when I come back from the army back in 1964 or 65, and I try to get into a fashion institute of technology. And because I had studied printmaking and pattern making, I was gonna be a tailor, but I wasn't accepted. So the next thing I, I did was, well, let's go to art school. You know, so I went to School of Visual Arts. I joined the School of Visual Arts about 1968. While, while at, the, at the School of Visual Arts, I meet a bunch of uh, artists who became my co, uh, uh, cohorts, and uh, we joined the Art Workers Coalition. At the Art Workers Coalition, we meet Rafael Ortiz Montañez, who is the, uh, the author of the concept of the Museo del Barrio. And his concept was to have a museum where the art will be taken out to the streets and uh, do away with, with the hierarchy of, of the museums. And, uh, and so we put that into practice also. When, when we created the Taller Bolivo, we had traveling exhibitions. That movie that you see there before, that was a traveling exhibition that we would pack a, a van with art and we'd take it out to different locations, set up in schoolyards, parks, festivals, wherever. And uh, that was a form of bringing art to the people, you know? So, uh, so I joined the Art Workers Coalition where I meet Rafael Ortiz Montañez, and uh, I meet Tom Lloyd, and I meet Faith Ringo. And there we are part of the Art Workers Coalition, uh, and we started doing demonstrations with them. Uh, there's a photo, uh, a bunch of photos over there on that wall that I took at one of the first protests that I, that I participated in. We, part, we did a protest against the Museum of Modern Art because they were showing an exhibition of the Surrealist Movement. And we felt that they were co-opting the Surrealist Movement, which was actually an uh, anti-war movement. And we were an anti-war movement, so we said we have to protest that exhibition, and we did. And and uh, within the art workers, there was uh, there was a group of Puerto Rican artists, which would say the Latin group. There was a group of black artists, Afro-American artists, and then there was a group of general artists, mostly uh, white uh, artists. And, uh, and so some of the issues involved, involved us, but we also had personal issues that we had to deal with. We had to deal with the non-representation of Puerto Rican and black art in the major uh, institutions. So we took that as one of our mentors, and we, and we protested against the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum, and, uh, and various other uh, institutions. Um, while, while we, we went and took over uh, Thomas Hoban's office, demanding that there be representation, we demanded that they decentralize uh, their, their holdings and spread, it, and spread the culture out to the different communities. That was our mantra. We, go, we want community art centers. Uh, so Thomas Hoban decided to uh, uh, to talk to, I forgot his name, I got it written down here, Donald Harper, who was the director of the New York State Council on the Arts. And we met with Donald Harper, and we said, listen, we want, we want funding for, for community art centers. And Donald Harper said, well, we have to, you have to prove it to us that you want, that, that that's a necessity, you know? So, 
I mean, we managed to get a grant from the State Council of the Arts, and we created what was called the uh, Community Artist Cultural Survey, which uh, all of us, all the Puerto Ricans and all the blacks, got a little tape recorder and some notebooks, and we were to go out into the communities and, and get uh, people to talk, you know, to give us uh, or the whys or why we should have community art centers and all that. And during that time, there was a big drug epidemic and everybody wanted their kids to be somewhere else except the streets, you know? So, so everybody, everybody went along with that. We went back to, uh, to the State Council of the Arts and presented the, the, the findings. And then they created what they called the Ghetto Arts Program, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Back then, <laughs> you know, they actually called it the ghetto art program. Yeah, the ghetto art program, which eventually became the special arts program. You know, so so that that was that was part of the uh, 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 of the beginnings of our involvement with the art workers and with the arts community. The arts workers community, I mean, the art workers coalition was also instrumental in getting a free day. At, at the museums, you know, uh, the the uh, uh, there, there were a few other things that we were able to to uh, uh, to, to acquire. Um, so after that, um, uh, the Kent State Massacre. In 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 honor of the Kent State Massacre, we will have a day without art. And that day, the art workers decided that we're going to close all the museums. So factions of different art workers went and protested against and closed, tried to close the museums, the Metropolitan, uh, the MoMA, et cetera, et cetera, all throughout the Brooklyn Museum. <coughs> the Bronx Museum wasn't there yet. The Bronx Museum was just an idea at that time. You know, it was like a... a, a a program that was in the courthouse in 163rd Street. So it wasn't a museum yet, a real museum. Uh, so, uh, so we went out, we decided to go and protest at, in front of the Museum of the City of New York, which was in East Holland. So we said, that's in our neighborhood, let's go over there. You know, well, we went over there, we, 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 we closed it down, Eventually what came out of these things is the Museum of the City of New York hired a woman called Betty Mango uh, to be the liaison between the museum and, and the community. The, the museum, the Metropolitan Museum hired, um, hey, what was the name? Oh my God. Um, anyway, uh, they hired a Puerto Rican uh, to be the liaison between the museum and, and the community, and uh, and uh, and those, those that was the beginning of the museum starting to relate to the communities, the actual communities. You know, eventually the metropol the metropolitan created uh, an exhibition which was I think the the history of Puerto Rican art or something our like that. Our, our heritage of Puerto Rico, right? The art heritage of Puerto Rico came out of that initiative. Uh, um, uh, the, the, the initiative uh, uh, things that we were doing. Uh, the the Museum of New York created programs also to deal with art and education, and uh, and by them creating by uh, the State Council of the Arts creating the Ghetto Arts Program. The Taylor Borico at Puerto Rican Workshop was able to get his first grant of five thousand dollars. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so uh, and, and we and we did we we started a program where we bought uh, we bought a a van and we load the van up with art and we would take it drive it around. To different locations, we set up outdoor exhibitions. We would take art to the community. Instead of having the, the community go to the museums, we would take art. At the same time, we use it as an educational vehicle. We would set up our, our posters like this on the wall. And then 
we, we start talking about the history, about, about the art, about, about the techniques that we use. That's what we got people interested. We would set up tables outside and, and do outside uh, workshops on print making, uh, linoleum cut and whatnot, you know? Uh, so so th those were the beginnings, those, those were the beginnings. We also uh, allied with, with the African-American artists and, and uh, protested against the exhibition called Harlem on My Mind uh, that the Metropolitan mm -hmm. Museum had. Uh, the Afro-American artists felt that there were a lot of pretty pictures, but it didn't say anything about the reality of Harlem anymore. There was a lot of artists like Faye Ringgold and Tom Lloyd, who were, uh, and Benny Andrews, who were practicing artists. And they wanted to be heard. They wanted to exhibit their art in the institutions. But the institutions didn't want the art being exhibited. Uh, out of that initiative, the Studio Museum was born. The Studio Museum was born on 125th Street and, um, and 5th Avenue on the second floor loft. That's why it was called the, the Studio uh, Museum. But it was a studio for artists initially. It was uh, at the Bola, there was a uh, Benny Andrews, there were a lot of Afro-American artists who were using the spaces there, you know? So um, so those, those are some of the beginnings that, that that, uh, that fermented along with the, the Puerto Rican workshop and, and uh, other organizations that started to uh, spring up uh, also, like here in the Lower East Side, Ch Charas was here, and it was, uh, and then four years after that, the New American Poets Cafe comes into, into play, you know? And they're still around, yeah. And uh, we still around. We've been around 54 years now. We uh, uh, we organized the workshop in 1969 and incorporated in 1970. Is that enough? You want me to keep going? <laughs> you know, I, I have a comment question. I believe that you know I'm not the only one, uh, but I believe that gonna I'm gonna give the word to Jasmine Ramirez. And at the end, uh, we can, you know, put a conversation. The, the only thing I want to mention is the, the blood dollar. We created the blood dollar, and we will give it out in demonstration. The blood dollar says, not valid for Puerto Rican, black artists, and female artists, you know? And, and, the, and that, that, that was very important back then, because even the women were an accepted in, in, in the Met or the Museum of Modern Art, you know? So, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's Some not questions. too different now. It's not too different now, you know? Probably the average of women and you know, black people increase a little bit, but not too much, you know? But, well, okay. May I say something for the records and for everybody watching us on Facebook? Uh, this is made possible, this talk in this exhibition, by the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and by UNESCO, who has given us a small grant to do the administration of such things. So thank you to the... Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Jasmine Ramirez uh, is an art worker, curator, and narrator uh, based in New York City. She holds a PhD in art history from the Graduate Center CUNY. Born in Brooklyn, Ramirez was active in the downtown art scene of the early 80s uh, as a cook kid and art critic for the East Village age. Attracted to the street and hip hop, she became acquainted with the emerging artists and writers, many of whom are now icons in the 80s. Currently an independent curator, uh, Ramirez has elaborated her own curatorial project with the Brown Museum and Museo del Barrio the Lois Ida Center, the New Museum, the Studio Museum in Harlem, Frank Franklin Furnit, and Tajer Boricua. It's a short video. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. So wonderful. Yes. Hi. Buenas tardes, everybody. Speak up, please. Yeah. Jasmine, speak okay. up. Um, speak up? Yep. Okay, I'm sorry. I have a little voice because of my allergies. So, um, what, I, what I have to say, number one, it's, it's been an honor 
of honoring my life or as I get um, It changed my life. I was I was born like in the movement, in the Rio Vegan movement. Um, so my first mentor actually it was was Gino Rodriguez that of the Alternative Museum. Um, and that was in like 1977, and it was such a different time then. I always tell my students, you know, these these organizations are crucial for a person like me, because I didn't come from money. Like today, if you try to get up to go to a place and try and work as an intern, they want to make sure that you have, like, are you from Yale or Columbia? I mean, you know, it's very elitist again today. But at that time, New York, because of people like Marcos, because of Thayer, was really dedicated to social justice and cultural equity for all. This was not, this was, this was genuine, and I saw it for myself through the archives, but also through the practice. The reason I can call myself an art worker, even though I wasn't obviously in the Art Workers Coalition, is because of, the, of, of what I learned day to day with Marcos and Nitsa and Fernando Sani Group, who are like my three mentors at, at Tayel. And, and, and you couldn't have anyone better, right? Because we do everything there, right? But I got to learn how to, remember Marcos, you, you made me like put up the, the, the paintings. You know, you taught me how to hang stuff. Because usually in a museum, you know, curators, you, don't, you, you, you actually cannot touch the work, right? You have to. You have to have them. scholars. It's very, very different. <coughs> yeah, and um, and as a result of this, I mean, I dedicated my my um, dissertation. I wrote the first dissertation on the Puerto Rican art movement in New York, and it was because of the graciousness of Marcos and Nitsa and so many many artists that gave me time because it's an oral history. You know, I'm still trying to make it into a book. And the other thing that I want to just mention briefly is like, why don't more people know about that yet in relationship to, for example, the Chicano movement, the New York movement? And one is numbers, but the other thing that struck me throughout is Marcos, um, the first show that Marcos did and, and, uh, was at the Brooklyn Museum, right? I mean, yeah. You, right, so there was, in 1969, that was an incredible year. I started the Puerto Rican Art Movement in 1969, because in January of 1969, you had the Harlem on My Mind exhibition mm -hmm. open, which was protested. You had the creation of the Art Workers Coalition, right, mm -hmm. um, at MoMA, which began really as an artist's rights, because uh, one of the artists took his piece out of the show, because he, did, he didn't like the way it was exhibited. Takis. Takis, that's right, Takis. That's how the Art Workers Coalition you know, comes into being. And then the third, which is often <clears throat> not discussed, is that the Brooklyn Museum holds the first exhibition of what today we call emerging Puerto Rican artists. Um, and that was an African-American curator who was a community, um, he was hired as a community liaison, the community curator, and and it was his idea to do a show about Puerto Rican artists because he said he had never met one. I mean, imagine, right? He said, you know, I, no one knows about Puerto Rican artists. Who are they? And the brilliant thing that he did, because he was trained from the Harlem Renaissance, because I mean, I have a whole thing about the Harlem Renaissance, the kind of training that that young people received. It was, it was incredible training. His vision, I'm oh, sorry, was that he didn't, he didn't go for it, he, didn't, he wasn't interested in going, for example, he could have gone to um, the Puerto Rico and gotten things from there, right? He could have gone to the department, the Puerto yeah, Rican yes. uh, government, and had an office here. But no, he said that he was interested in encouraging young artists he wanted to see the new generation, and this is how it comes into being. Mm -hmm. um, so, one of the things that become difficult for me as an art historian to sell is this notion of success. Because Marcos' first show, the Puerto Ricans began at the Brooklyn Museum, right? But then they decide to stay in El Barrio. And that, is, and that kind of commitment is something that younger people really don't recognize anymore. 
anymore. They're like, so you start in a museum and then you stayed in El Barrio. I mean, usually the trajectory, the success, the success that we are taught, a successful artist goes from grassroots to a museum to collectors, right? I mean, where is the whole, that whole um, infrastructure, right, was not created specifically because we, these artists believe in art for the people and it has had some consequences as an art historian. So I really had to rethink, you know, what, what are these contributions? The first and most important aesthetically is, is that they brought the Afro-Taino aesthetic to New York. I mean, this is an incredible thing. People didn't know about the Dainos. That wasn't taught. You know, so I mean, that in itself is aesthetic. I mean, in, in terms of something else, it's like these guys were doing social practice art way, way before, right? It, it's, it's become funded today, but these are the original like social practice artists. The, the history of Puerto Rico, you know, carrying on the tradition of the young lords and what was going on there, and educating the, the, the community. And in fact, once the young lords disbanded, a lot of them went into these cultural institutions, and it's through culture that, that this <coughs> revolutionary spirit continues um, and is taught to us. You know, I, I have pictures in my mind now of what that revolution is because they made it possible. So um, that's what I have to, you know, that's where I want to end it. But in terms of legacy, you know, Dayen is the, you know, origins of the New Yorican movement in New York. You cannot talk about New Yorican movement without Dayen Borigua. And I'm hoping that, you know, one day, I've written several, several extensive articles, but we're working on the book. Um, and right now, Arlene Davila and I, for example, we're coming up with a, uh, uh, co-editing uh, an anthology on the New Yorker movement that's going to be published by Duke. So, you know, we'll look out for that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I believe that you are pointing out relevant things about the issues to work in the grass of the neighborhood. So that's quite relevant. You know, in, in the first wall of this exhibition on that corner, I decided to install four documents. The first one is in 1969, the first year. Mm -hmm. uh, I found a second document of uh, 1979. Then three years after that in 89, and the last one in 99. And you can see the process every two years, you know, relevant exhibition, you know. Uh, reviews in magazines, in newspaper, you know, for relevant people. So when I found that information, it's, it's not one year, you know, four years in documents. So it's, it's such a wonderful thing, really, when you are, you know, addressing. Okay, uh, today Esperanza Cortez uh, is um, with us. Esperanza is a New York-based multidisciplinary contemporary artist who creates installations which incorporate sculptures, drawings, prints, painting, and video. Cortez has exhibited extensively in the United States in a solo group, ex in solo and group exhibition in Venice, including Bronx Museum, Queens Museum of Art, El Museo del Barrio, MoMA PS1, Socrates Sculpture Park, and Taller Boricua Gallery in New York. Nationally, Cortez has shown at the Cleveland Art Museum, Cleveland, Ohio, Helen Day Art Center, uh, BT, and the Lorenzo Homer Gallery, Philadelphia. Um, Esperanza has been linked as an artist at various times in the Puerto Rican workshop. Uh, hello, Esperanza, and thanks to be with us today. Hi, everybody. Um, so my history with El Taller Boricua begins in 1992. I had been artist in residence at El Museo del Barrio, and I found out about El Taller Boricua. So I applied for a show, I sent them my slides, which is what you did at that time. Um, and they accepted my work and I had a show. But before that, I have to say that I was born in Colombia and raised in the United States. 
And like Yasmin, I have a very similar background coming from um, immigrants who struggle to make a place in this country, no privilege. And um, I found that Puerto Ricans were so much more open to hearing my opinion, looking at my work, exhibiting my work than you know, pretty much anyone. And also the fact that I was a young single mother, that did not play in the art world. You know, I mean, people just would not break a as an artist. So um, I had experience with other uh, Puerto Rican organizations before Daya Boricua. But in 1992, I showed at a, I, I remember we were organizing the show at Daya Boricua. And that's when it was on uh, 106th Street. And um, I met Marcos, I met Fernando, and I remember I had like a mild meltdown of terror, like how is this gonna work out? And Marcos just straightened me out, like, come on girl, get serious. <laughs> and I tell, pe I tell people the story, they're like, Marcos has never raised his voice. I said, well, it's got tough with me, I don't know. <laughs> but it was, it was a great uh, experience. It was a one person show. Um, at that time, the village voice was very important, and my my uh, image of my work was in the centerfold of the village voice for what was called Black Attack, which was this women's organization. Um, so it was an extraordinary experience, but it was also like a strange uh, experience in a different way. It was like getting to know family that you didn't know you were related to. And Fernando was wonderful, Marcos was wonderful, later on I met Nitsa. I mean, it was just like, you know, people who could love you and put you in your place real quick, which I never minded, you know, because I have to say, for me, uh, the Colombian community, the arts community, did not accept me in the same way because I was raised here. And they would always tell me that I didn't speak like the Colombian because, you know, of course, I grew up in the United States, so I had everybody's accent mixed into mine. But also, everybody's story mixed into mine because I, 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 for me, my identity was more as, as, a, as an immigrant, a person who was creating their place. Very different from growing up in your own country where you have your place and people accept you as one of them. Um, you know, it's just like, for me, a very common question, especially when I go to residencies, like I just did the U Cross residency in Wyoming, um, most of the people I was with were wonderful, but outside of the artists and, and creative people, people immediately were like, so what country are you from? This one! <laughs> and, and this was one of the first uh, conversations I had with Marcos, where he said, oh, I know what you mean, it's the same for Puerto Ricans. <laughs> we go to Puerto Rico, we're not Puerto Rican. We come here, we're not American. But that's exactly how I felt. I felt like I was in this weird in-between place, which I felt gave me an ability to see things clearer. I decided that this was a positive thing. It's just like, you know, a lot of the work that I saw that Marcos was producing, Fernando was producing, Nietzsche was producing, I mean, God, and Rafael, all these people were just so cutting edge and, and just fearless, you know, while everybody else was trying to play nice so they could be, you know, part of the art book. So I felt like, being associated with, with uh, Marcos and Fernando and then later Nietzsche it just made me braver, you know, made me uh, accept, well, not accept, but go through moments of disrespect and finding a way back of like being able to talk about myself and my work and its relevance. And, you know, I had a great time. I mean, that's part of the world they but after we show. <laughs> so I have to thank uh, uh, Marcos, Fernando, and Nietzsche for the great times that I had and, and the feeling of being accepted. That, that was really great. So, that's it. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Esperanza. Uh, I would like to mention something because uh, someone sent me an email and that was curious, asking me why I have decided to include and not non-Puerto Rican artists and a non-Latin American artists in the exhibition uh, because there is a, Stephanie Lee is a Korean artist and as um, Esperanza mentioned, he was born in Colombia and that was a, was a very rude comment but I had to explain her that the Taller Boricua uh, 
had had you know a huge vision about the art world and uh, and about the Latin America and and the, you know their goal to you know to be in space to produce art to allow to artists to connect each other in different cultures. So uh, my decision to include those artists was founded in, in the work that you have done during the whole these 54 years, and I believe that is relevant, you know, in opposition of uh, other artists who decided to be more focused in their own cultural trajectories as they, you know, the white cube. Uh, other, you know, movements in the city probably they more they were more interested into things and you know into fight with the idea of the white cube. You were linked with the community directly, and that means everyone for the reason that was important. And the other reason in this exhibition, uh, you know, to have those artists is because sometimes people, you know, could think that you know, oh yes, yeah, something that happened. 54 years ago, but no, we have Esperanza Cortez, a contemporary artist, linked with the workshop, and other, you know, youngest artists. I believe that is relevant. It means that we are talking about the past, but from the present, and the people that, you know, they're building the, the history of the city. You know, they didn't stop 50 years ago. That's, that's relevant. We're still here, Marcus is still here. So we hope that the Taller Boric was still with us for a long time, so long thank time. you, thank you, Esperanza. Okay, uh, Jorge, uh, thanks, thank you, Jorge. Jorge Lozano Lorza is an immigrant mixed race artist and filmmaker born in Colombia. He is the author of the video, the Puerto Rican obituary of Pedro Pietri, included in the exhibition. Lozano documented the poet in his last year through the streets of New York City. He has been painting and filming and making videos, song performance, and installation work since he went to Canada in 1971. He has made over 170 movies, work uh, that live not in between but within culture. His work is a reflection of his personal commitment to epistemological disobedience and the investigation of, investigation of different ways of thinking, feeling, and doing to see the world differently to have a visible presence and to create new coordination with living and non-living matter. Jorge's fiction short and experimental work has been screened at TIFF and Sonda and internationally at many festivals, museums, galleries, and community cultural centers. Since 1991, he has facilitated self-representation video workshops for <coughs> marginalized Latin and non-Latin youth and art students in Canada, Colombia, Brazil, Peru, and Venezuela. Thank you for it and, and welcome. Well, thank you, thank you for inviting me. I, I am really happy and very honored to be here today listening to such a powerful, rich history of uh, the resistance, the cultural and political resistance of uh, Puerto Rican people in the United States and um, obviously connected to the island as well. I, I am, I always respect very much uh, Puerto Rican culture. And, um, and um, um, I went to New York and um, I, I helped, he asked me to, to, to help him to film a, a, an installation performance he was doing in New York that it was uh, a screen of a woman, talk, a, a recording of a woman talking and the performance was uh, in New York, he did it talking to the woman on the screen. It, it, it's a play, I can't remember very much uh, uh, the content of it. But uh, at that time, uh, I, I was very friends with Pedro, uh, Pedro and um, we decided to do the, the, the Puerto Rican obituary just to film it. I had a really cheap uh, little camera, a VHS camera, and uh, the idea was just to go to different places in New York that he would remember as important. Um, doing that, I, I had the opportunity to know Pedro, Pedro more and, uh, and, uh, and, and know more about him. Uh, for instance, being in his house, I was, I, I was impressed by, by the way that he lived in his house. It was a house that it was, uh, uh, it only had black paintings. Uh, he had a collection of black paintings and, 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 and I don't know what happened to those black paintings, but I, I mean, it was, it was kind of a, you know, work that he's done. Uh, and, um, while we were recording the 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 the, the poem, 
in New York, uh, we had a lot of conversations on on the importance of um, how pumps, you know, they, they like like that that pump is still relevant right now, and it was relevant when we made it in 1997, obviously, but it was written it was written in 1973. So so I I was really curious to, talking to them about how can we see these pumps in the time that they were made because in 1973. Um, it, it was a whole different picture with the alphabet. I, I mean, the place where you guys are right now, I think that it was very different then. Um, the the alphabet, it was it was like a war zone full of uh, 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 junkies, you know, people from the from the Puerto Rican community, and, and we know why what what caused that the CIA influx of, of drugs in the 60s in, into Harlem and, and all those and all those neighborhoods. And I and I happened to be there at that time, and, and so we were talking about that because I think that the roots and the genesis of this poem is basically a, a very hard, that, and Puerto Ricans will be pushed against the, you know, this place constantly. And uh, and, and in, in the upper east, in the upper east side, in the 110, 120, I mean, it was also very different as well. That it was another part that inspired the poem. So, so those conversations uh, were, were really interesting, and and, and um, uh, yeah, ba basically that's that that was my encounter with Pedro and uh, for last four or five years, and uh, uh, didn't see him anymore. Um, then I, I I was told that he died, and they asked me to give them a copy in CD. I can't remember who because they created a. a a container with a lot of stuff from Petro that they bury somewhere to wait for the future to come and reopen it and see what happens. And I, and so, but that's basically it. And and uh, and and, and, uh, and it is um, also when I was listening to you, I was just thinking about how that history, history that we fight so much to make visible because because it had been made invisible, it's still not that visible, right? And and and, and in terms, for instance, with Pedro's. Uh, plays like he gave me a book of his plays, uh, which I I read. I remember the living room and and very absurd displays, almost like a UNESCO, but but in a in a, in a in, with a vision and a techniques of uh, you know Puerto Rican Puerto Rican feeling and, and sense of humor. So so unfortunately, I never seen those plays in in Latin America. I know that they done them in New York. I don't know how much, but they're incredible plays, you know. So so. Those things that get lost, and I think that this exhibition is really important. We should be doing exhibitions every ten years to to revive, you know, because um, for for our immigrants and for Puerto Ricans, especially in the United States, had to reinvent constantly, you know, to 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 say hey, we're still here, so, you kind know, of uh, in some ways, I think. But um, I mean, uh, that, that's that's basically. Thank you, thank you for thank that. You. Uh, I would like to say that the video is uh, already online, and you know, it, uh, now it's a new document that is available for everybody. Uh, then, thank you, thank you uh, for him. Okay, uh, Rick Alberto Colon is a choreographer, actor, and co founder of Whole Artist Inc., Downtown Whole Festival, former creative director of the Arthur Vega Foundation an artistic director of Whole Happening Gallery, Whole Haha Gallery, uh, SAC Astra, EA Affil TV, <laughs> at present directing his own open play for Miguel Pinheiro, relationship to his mother. Okay, thank you, welcome. Thank you. I've got to say that I am, I don't know what the proper word is, but to sit on this panel with with um, you guys, it's really like, I just feel like I should just be saying thank you. So I'll start off by saying that as a young kid, I grew up in the Barrio Spanish Harlem. I wasn't aware of the Puerto Rican person in my family for a very long time. <clears throat> so the story, my story is that my grandfather immigrated from Puerto Rico in the early 1940s. His, his grandparents had a farm in Utuado, Puerto Rico, and it was bombed. It was bombed when there was the transaction of Americans coming in, this, that, or whatever. My, my grandfather moved to Ponce with his parents, and they were, they were getting much older. He was having a lot of trouble finding work because he was a 
very much an activist, very much um, worried about what happened, what would happen to Puerto Rican culture, and he was a bit of a troublemaker. Whatever that means, I, I would hope it's good trouble. Um, at any point, he moved to New York, and he opened up what I found out later may have been the first Puerto Rican-owned jewelry store in Spanish Harlem on 103rd and Lexington, not too far from the train station. And uh, it's a Chinese laundry now, or was a Chinese laundry. But at any point, he would repair watches and sell jewelry. And during the night, he would go up to the factory in New Jersey and uh, make paper cups for Dixie. Um, Dixie Company. So anyway, my grandfather met a woman in, in Spanish Harlem at the Marqueta, who was a Native American Indian that was uh, touring the country with the Catholic Church. She was taken from her family to deprogram her from being a Native American, and she traveled with the Catholic Church around the country, and she became a linguist. She became a teacher. When she came to New York in the Marqueta, she saw my grandfather, who couldn't speak English. She could speak Spanish, but she was with the nuns. And um, <laughs> she made it a point to come back to the market there again without the nuns. And she introduced herself to my grandfather. And anyway, the story was they fell in love. She ran away from the church. And in the back of that little store at 103rd and Lexington, she raised six children. And, uh, yeah, and she taught um, English to um, Italian kids and the Puerto Rican kids in the backyard. Everyone became her children, and she was known as Doña Teresa. She was ashamed of being a Native American, and she took on the persona of being a, a, a Puerto Rican. My grandfather was a Puerto Rican who would not allow anyone to speak Spanish in the house because he was ashamed he wasn't ashamed when he moved there. I think he was beaten down. Um, the way my aunts and uncles told me that his nickname at work in New Jersey at the paper company was Spick, mm. because mm. He, was, he would always say, I don't speak English. So he was very ashamed of his accent and stuff. <coughs> anyway, so I'm the product of a, of, of, <laughs> of a family that was really uh, not interested in identifying who they are or whatever. But I grew up in Minsk in the Puerto Rican culture in the barrio. I actually um, found theater in the streets in Puerto Rico. I found the museums and your discussion, talking about the museums, take me back to a discussion I had with my well and my grandmother. When I was a young kid, we'd go to Fifth Avenue, hit the museums, and I would always be struck by the fact that all the art that I was seeing never looked like me. I never really told the story about me. So I started investigating as I got older about my grandfather, so on and so forth. Anyway, I became an actor and I met Miguel Pinero one day after filming a, a movie in Times Square called, it was called Times Square, the Trini Alvarado. And um, I left set and went down to the train station, 42nd Street in Times Square, and I saw Miguel Pinera. I knew who he was because I was very interested in what was the flavor at the time. It seemed like Puerto Rican art and stuff was on the street. It wasn't in establishments, it was in the street, or you'd find it. It was like you'd bump into it, and I immersed myself in it. My aunt, Alicia Colon, was the first Puerto Rican artist to have her work exhibited in a World's Fair. And I attached myself to her because I knew I would learn more about the arts. So years later, I became a professional actor and met Miguel Pinero in this neighborhood. Um, I moved to this neighborhood just about 40 years ago. Met Miguel Pinero again. I guess you would say he wasn't, his work was very popular, but he was very much um, a product of what he was involved with in the streets, of drugs whatsoever. Um, anyway, um, time went on, and I started working on films here in the Lower East Side with Miguel Pinedo. Um, Law and Water, many different parts. The only, uh, the only acting parts that were available to a young kid like me was I would get hired to come to the Lower East Side to mug somebody. Um, you know, it was always that type of a negative image. But I was 
very attached to Miguel Pinedo. I actually think as a young boy I had a crush on his swag. I don't know. It was something <laughs> about him, just this swag. But he was always very protective of me. So anyway, I, I'm moving fast. Uh, but um, um, So coming back to modern times now, um, I was there when Miguel Pinedo's ashes were scattered on the Lower East Side. Um, and I remember how it really impacted me. You know, to see him, to see him have that uh, tribute is a beautiful thing. So I had this personal story, this feeling about Miguel Pinedo, Pinedo's mom had in what her son had done with words. She was always very good with words. She was known for her, her ability to put letters together and words together, and she took credit for that um, gift that he had. So um, with that that I say, that I feel that what I'd like to say here is that I think what's very attractive now <coughs> is um, Latinos, of all, all Latinos coming together and lifting the history of Puerto Ricans and the art movement, and the, um, the jewel of being a Boricua. The, uh, you know, I was, I was saying to someone that my mother used to say that an accent is the jewelry of language. <laughs> And yeah. I repeated to that someone today because that, you know, my mother, it, it helped my mother that she used to remember what her father had gone through, always being called spick and not liking his accent. So I'm very intrigued with this, this presentation here today, with this panel, and with um, what I hope is going to be a resurgence of uh, Latino and Puerto Rican artists stepping up. And when I look at the walls in here, I remember as a young boy, the art and the prints and the, uh, you know, the printers and everything, the people that I would see, political art was what I was exposed to first as a kid. And then with Miguel Pinero and with the poetry, and then um, Pierdio Puretri, uh, sorry for my, my um, my New Yorkian, it's very bad. Anyway, um, he was my next door neighbor as a young adult in Manhattan Plaza. He was my neighbor. So I was always being hit with this uh, reattachment to my culture. And now as a, a young adult, um, traveling to Puerto Rico and returning to Puerto Rico with my husband, <coughs> and I will be, I have property there now. I am very intrigued with writing about my grandfather's experience, why he left Puerto Rico, what happened when he came here, and what would have happened if we went back. So I'm very uh, intrigued and um, working on a, a film screen right now. That's it. That's all I have to say. It's a bit of a bit of <laughs> Thank you, Wiki. You know, sharing this powerful story is, uh, you know, I, I'm very moved. And I would like to say when you mentioned that uh, idea of your mother yeah. about the accent, uh, that uh, reminds me, you know, because I learned English reading, yeah. reading, reading alone. Then, uh, alone, you know, a while ago, someone started to load about my pronunciation, yeah. and I said, you can understand me? <laughs> yes, I can understand. That person said, y si te hablo en español puedes entender, and he stayed quiet. And I said, who's, who's smart here? <laughs> here right? You or me? You know, this is the thing. But uh, you know, I, I, I thought about that when I was designing the exhibition. And when, we, I, uh, and when Marco showed me the documents you know, at the beginning, because I, I thought about the Tito's story and Eduardo Cruz, you know, the police, Tito, you yeah. know, they capture him one day and two hours later, you know. Uh, and my decision was, I'm not gonna victimize uh, no. the, the victims, you know. Right. I'm gonna put in the surface uh, the art and the great thing that they have been done during yes. all this time. Then uh, I'm not gonna hide the terrible things, no. Everything is in here, but at the same time, uh, the, it, this is uh, something that has changed my path uh, during the process of uh, uh, this exhibition is how you can reinvent, how, how you, 
yourself? How can you change your answers uh, to the bad thing? Because they always answer it uh, with art. You know, they kill a person, they create a gallery. Yes. Uh, they were violent, then they create a workshop. And, and on that way, artists are welcome to, yes. you know, to change the context, the social context. So that's relevant. Okay. Um, we have uh, the last uh, key of our puzzle today. Is uh, Stephen? Thank you so much to be here today. Uh, Stephen is an advocacy journalist. Uh, sorry, architecture critic, urbanist, and project organizer based in New York City. A graduate of Michigan State University at New School for Social Research with a bachelor degree in interdisciplinary humanities and a master in liberal studies, he founded Clean's Public Art Project and served as a president of Amplifier Inc., a non-governmental non organization that employs emerging ideas, media design, design, and aesthetic strategies to advance alternative political and economic framework and institutional transformation. He has published in the New York Times, Billy Voice, Art in America, Dual Architectural Review, Oculus, Landscape Architecture Magazine, Architectural Record, and you know, among <laughs> many, many, many others. So um, thank you because Stephen is with us today to put uh, the artistic and historical context of the New York City, of, um, you know, the period of um, the entire world because he started to work in the city. So thank you so much. Oh, thanks. Um, first, thank you for bringing out this incredible history and making it present. You know, the opportunity to learn about these kind of giants living among us that, it, you know, it's just a, an incredible thing to, to kind of have, have and to, to, to ex expose and, and bring out. So, and to Juan as well for, for hosting. Um, so, <clears throat> You know, for me, I came to the opening of this show and, and got to meet Mar Marcos, which was, you know, just like a moment of discovery and, <coughs> and recognition because having researched this period for, for about 10 years, working on a, a, a book that's still, still in process, um, <coughs> I recognized that Taya Borut, who I was a part of the Art Workers Coalition, but I knew nothing about that you know involved him, so um, you know I got to ask him, you know, how did you end up involved in this mo moment? I mean, um, and so you mentioned that that you were um, at S SVA, but you you didn't mention it. I think to 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 me you had been classes with Tom Paka, who who was also. Teaching there, mm -hmm. Hans Hans Hacke. Oh yeah. Well, um, in any case, what my understanding of this prehistory um, was that um, this artist Ta Takis, as you as 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 you were saying, was protesting his art being involved in this show, the work of art, in age of mechanical reproduction, or something like that. It was sort of a kinetic art show. And Hans Hacke also had a piece in the show that was not being han handled properly. It was like this, you know, before he became an institutional critique person, he was doing these kind of like kinetic sculptures. And it was supposed to kind of freeze it and, and, and it, it, it would melt it because they were unplugging it at the end of the night. So that was initially why this claim was made by the artist that we have a right in relation to our art. And it seems to me that this was, you know, a beginning of like this an explosion of the idea. We can make claims on institutions and we can form new institutions because of our, you know, the, the, these claims, these demands that formed around this coming together of people, you know, a group of artists all with individual, you know, and community in interests to make, you know, a list of what, 10, how many demands were there? Mm. It was like 19, yeah. I, there was a large, large number, mm -hmm. 13 demands. It was 13, and I always remember that because 
because the young lords also had 13 demands. Yeah. And I always yeah. said, I wonder if really, you know, <laughs> they, um, and the art workers were kind of copying yeah. the, the young lords because the young, the, I've seen exhibitions where they had young lords posters up. Uh, you know, like when they would do the group exhibitions, uh, the Art Workers Coalition, they definitely, they definitely had, they had Black Panther uh, posters up there too. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, just to bring out some of the theme, themes that, that were discussed, um, um, that just the notion that this was a, this was a moment when all of these institutions formed, you know. Harlem, Harlem, the El Barrio, Lucia del Barrio, and many, many more. Cobra, um, Cobra, the two institutions. Yeah. African American artist Cobra. Yeah. So, and and to me, the story is about um, you know uh, belonging and and power, actually, like. Who has the power to speak, to be rec to be recognized, and to to be uh, in included in the formation of policy about na neighborhoods, where 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 we live, um, and, and um, <clears throat> you know, my research and ends up going back to you know a, a maybe maybe <clears throat> 10, 20 years be before this when. Some of, some of the the key power brokers of, of the coming era were were essentially planning planning the city. They were bankers. They were you know heads of corporations. And um, did they think that it mattered to talk to somebody in the Puerto Rican community about what you know what the plan would be for the Lower East Side? Um, when they designated it as a sl as a slum and to be cleared and and redeveloped as you know middle class housing and you know a, a highway thoroughfare and this this sort of thing, so the so the 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 other thing that I, I was recalling as I was thinking about this moment was there were bombings by Puerto Rican nationalists during during this period I think in 1969 in fact. Uh, that that were that were arguing for Puerto Rican independence. This goes to questions of col colonialism that are incredibly salient at the moment. That have to do with you know who who has con control over you know nation nations in in fact and uh, and so I mean I think you know, I'm not necessarily a, bit, a big nationalist. I think I like the idea that. You know the sense of belonging of of the U.S. in principle, according to a, a New Yorkian notion, should extend to all the people here and all the people who want to be here, really. But um, but that that said, you know, um, I you know I I I I, I, I sort of hear your tear, tears as an expression of this this sense of. A recognition of belonging, <coughs> of having a place, of 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 um, ultimately having power o o over the space of, of of our our li lives in the city. So I mean that's kind of a brief sort of way that I, that I think about this. Um, I also mentioned the the other person that I was aware of who who. Stood out to me as a, as kind of an outlier um, at uh, during the formation of the Art Workers Coalition was Rafael Ortiz, who I was you know curious about and ended up researching and inter interviewing him because I was like, oh, there was a Puerto Rican artist who was visible, you know, at this time, who was fairly famous and had, you know was really affiliated with this kind of fluxus generation of conception conceptual artists um, doing this most famous piece was the, the destruction in art um, symposium piece of the um, piano 
destruction. What was it called? And he, he he still does it sometimes. This the the basically taking a taking a chainsaw S to a piano. A sledgehammer. Yeah. Original. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he's also still around, li living living in New, <coughs> New Jersey, and um, um, just you know, fo founders of institutions. King, kings. Uh, I don't like that term, king, because I don't like monarchies, but hero, heroes of the mass. So yeah, thanks yeah, for yeah, 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 yeah. thanks yeah. for being here. Can I ask a question to Stephen? Uh, I came here about. 50 years ago on June 10th to Tompkins Square. And I remember south of the Lion Sea, right? Yes. Was beginning to be torn out, right? It was a Puerto Rican enclave yes. of citizens, Puerto Rico living there. And throughout the years, I came and went to Boston, etc., the school, the parking lots south of the Lion Sea remain as parking lots. And I used to say, what the hell? Why don't they develop this? And I did some research, and the Puerto Ricans had the right of return, but it was expired in 50 years. Now you see, what you were saying before, Essex, Essex crossings, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we should have uh, Alan Moore talk and, and company talk Sean about Silver. talk about this. Alan, <laughs> can you add something to that? Because, of course, I mean, the only thing that I've actually published about this whole Tranche of research was about their project um, to re to to basically um, as an insurrectionary act claim a piece of city-owned real estate and turn it into a, a, an art space on Delancey Street that was part of this urban renewal mm -hmm. area, right? I I and I, I I love the story that Tom Otterness was like the lookout. When they went and broke, broke the lock of the of this city-owned building with, Gangster. you know, and uh, and Alan and Alan, Alan and Peter Monig, who's now in in back in Germany, but um, I don't know if you want to talk to him, add anything to the story, but he's also a historic this art historian. So. Could you add something to that? If you if you like, yeah. if you like, yeah. Alan. Um, well. You know, we were kind of inspired by uh, Chavez because we thought they had occupied the building with the Italians. Yeah. But I think they got a contract like instantly. And we actually got a contract instantly. Well, within within a couple months, we had an art place. The city like invited us to dialogue and hey, what do you want? Well, gee whiz, <laughs> we would like a space. Yeah. Uh, you know, because what happened was when we were open for a very short period of time, hours, you know, during that time, tenants, a tenant organizer from some of the apartment buildings that were being evicted for this clearance that Stephen was speaking about, came into our space and said, man, we'd like to have meetings here. Really dangerous. So get those guys out of there, give them a space. Stop this stuff. And of course we took it. <laughs> Take what you can get. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I should mention that this exhibition is part of a program that we started with one, uh, named uh, New York Art Escapes. Mm -hmm. And it's dedicated to in, you know, to put in the surface other cultural process that uh, has been occurred here in New York, but at the same time, the idea is not only to talk in an aesthetic way, it's to talk about the social connection with the context, with historical context that brought you at this moment when the real estate, you know, is destroying basically the life of everybody in the city. And I don't know, someone says a few days ago, a, a New Yorker artist, he, he, she said that probably in, in 50 years, New York will be like uh, this city in the middle of the country, you know, without people like uh, New Yorkers, artists, you know. Uh, what is going to happen? I believe that you have been talking about the governance uh, of the community 
you know, on the city. And I believe that the problem is, uh, you know, going further than the art world, you know, it's about the life people. And it's something that I try to put it in the context of this exhibition, is, is you know, how uh, in, a, in a moment when art, in when the artists probably were more interesting in galleries, I know that yeah. it's a, 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 that a thing that we need probably, uh, but they started to work in a, in a school with people. Now for us that's very familiar because we are talking about social justice, you know, workshops <coughs> and etc. But 15 years ago, say the artists wanted, you know, to make a display in the, at the entrance of a school that was like a work, you know, what are you doing? You know, that's not art. We need white walls in a museum, in a place to show art. Yeah. And that's relevant, you know. Uh, this is uh, something that happened after the cultural <coughs> studies, you know, in, in 90s. Mm -hmm. they, they started to do that in, in, at the beginning of the 70s. That's something relevant. If that was a new path at that moment, you know. Um, well, uh, we have been working for a while, but I don't know if it's someone to comment, uh, you know, something or a question or maybe Jorge, Esperanza, or yes, please. Uh, I think the two items uh, uh, that are directly correlated to the Art Workers Coalition and to Diaz, one of which is uh, when school decentralization started mm -hmm. and in, in the Lower East Side, the UFT and the Jewish Defense League and the senior citizens, uh, the retired teachers group in the, in the housing projects, rose up to try and crush the decentralization movement. Now, the Art Workers Coalition, the artists in the neighborhood, uh, we all banded together, and uh, I was running an educational program and a building, I don't think it exists anymore, between uh, six feet between B and C, and, as, and there's uh, teachers and, and parents boycotting the school that came to my place. Now, it was I, we had just the, the sense that the artists were so involved in, in this whole process, yeah. the sense that the parents were involved, teachers who cared were involved, and what was very clear was the blatant racism of the UFT, what was going to happen to the schools, the decentralization, and how unsafe the neighborhoods are going to be, especially where the retired teachers were. And they were able, so that was one, that was one issue. The other one I think is very important that uh, Marcos is involved in, and it was a real important, uh, it was an important moment in organizing our, our the Puerto Rican Latino artists. That was the CEDA Artist Program that ran from the 78 to about 82. And there was the general CEDA program for New York City, then there was one for the, uh, managed by the Association of Hispanic Arts. I, all of the artists I, I've worked with and the organizations I've worked with came out of that, from, from Marcus Dimas, from, from Zabra Rolong, from uh, Manny Vega, you know, but it brought everybody together. Uh, you had into our theater there, you had, uh, uh, you had Hepatorio there, so it, it brought this wonderful coalition of, of artists and, and as a way of funding uh, arts organizations, and many of which exist to this day. The other thing I think is extraordinary, as a, as a little, you know, among these extraordinary stories, all, all of them, was, was uh, the notion that you had someone like Patrick Ireland, who worked for the New York State Council on the Arts, you know, was a conceptual artist himself, but had a double identi identity as an administrator, create this workshop program that then funded you know, all, of, all of these new emerging uh, <coughs> alternative galleries and, and spaces. So we worked for the NEA. His program oh, was NEA. national. Oh, NEA, yeah, yeah. It's national. And it was inspired yeah. by activities in New York. Yeah. Brian. Well, I wanted to, can you hear me? Yes. Brian, yeah. Brian Authority, yes. I just wanted to make a remark okay. as yes. an artist. Of, I've lived in the Lower East Side since I was very young. That's where I moved to when I realized that the way I wanted to live wasn't going to work in a more conservative area. 
And um, as I said, I was a young mother, but then I, I got into teaching early because of Maya. And I didn't become a, I didn't become a teaching artist on purpose. It just kind of happened, you know, that someone uh, was uh, not able to make it. They asked me to work, and then I was told, wow, you are really good at this. And so I taught for a very, very long time. And I feel like so much of how we view uh, social practice um, was created by a lot of artists who are looking for ways to use their work as a positive energy in, in the culture. I mean, I was. I mean, I was aware of the fact that there were a lot of mis things that I felt were missing from my daughter's own education that of course I as an artist would bring into her school, but then it, it was, I was everywhere. And at the time that I, I started um, showing at Italia Boricua, I taught a great deal in um, El Barrio. And most of my children were uh, Puerto Rican. You know, it's just this awareness that we're all part of the same family. This, this, this other, I, what, what we're countering is when everybody is separated into silos, you know, like, which was part of the colonial idea. Everyone gets separated as if we're all like different fruits. <laughs> no peaches but apples. And so, um, so it, it's the interesting thing, and I'm sure that Marcos could talk about it, that when you work with people who are really young and then go back to your work, it affects your work. I mean, my work is completely affected by everything I ever did with children and then teenagers and then elders. It all, you know, it's all a circular thing, but this way of working was begun by a lot of people who, who felt it was just not enough to show in galleries. You know, that was, that was not enough. And then, of course, other people pick it up as a way of getting attention. But I don't think it was the original reason that a lot of people did this, was not to get attention, but to actually feel that your work is, is, is a positive energy in the world, that your work is a way that helps people connect, and especially that helps children find their place in society. Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Very well said, thank you. Um, any comments? Or questions? Jorge, would you like to say anything? Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, thank you, everybody. Uh, to the, you know, today is our, our last day. This is the closing day, so this that has been a very, uh, you know, very deeply process during the whole month. We have had different people coming. And I, especially, I can remember especially uh, John May who come, he's a student, history, and he was interested in uh, revolution and art. He's a New York student, and he was ashamed because he doesn't speak Spanish. And he oh. said, no, it's okay, that's not, that's not a problem. And when he finishes, uh, you know, uh, the tour for the exhibition, he said, oh my God, I, I barely can breathe. I'm, I'm so excited. It's like, a, you know, I found a, a, a door that I can open yeah. as a New York So, you know, very emotional exhibition, including for me. So I um, thank you, and uh, including this, this round table. Thank you, everybody, Stephen Marco, you know, thank you so much. Uh, Jasmine, thank you, uh, Esperanza, for you. Thank you, Juan, and thank everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're going to close the evening with a very famous <laughs> Bud Light, the things you shoot at when you don't feel good. <laughs> for free. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And this ends the transmission. Wait, what? <laughs> Bye -bye.